Every week, hundreds of fishers die, and even more put their lives at risk to feed so many of us around the world. It's one of the most dangerous professions, yet there are still no international minimum safety standards in force. It's time to change that. The IMO's Cape Town Agreement sets global requirements for safety on fishing vessels that operate on the high seas and are 24 meters in length or 300 gross tons and above. Once 22 states with 3,600 qualifying vessels ratify it, the agreement will enter into force the following year. Global implementation is not only achievable, but critical to saving lives. In 10 chapters, the Cape Town Agreement details the minimum safety standards for fishing vessels and their crew. Chapter 1 covers general provisions like vessel eligibility. Most of the technical requirements apply only to new vessels built after the agreement enters into force. For the requirements that apply to existing vessels, states have 5 to 10 years after the agreement enters into force to implement those provisions. Vessels smaller than 24 meters or 300 gross tons and vessels of all sizes that stay in the waters of the flag state are not required to meet these standards. Chapter 2 focuses on vessel construction. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented upon entry into force. Vessel construction must prioritize hull integrity and vessel water tightness. All openings, including doors, hatches and windows, must be constructed in a way that prevents water from entering, which can lead to a vessel capsizing and sinking. Chapter 3 covers stability. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented upon entry into force. Stability is the most important factor in the overall safety of any vessel. Stability means that the vessel is able to return to its upright position after being healed by external forces such as wind, waves, ice or the strain from heavy fishing gear. Ships must not only be constructed to ensure stability, but skippers need documentation that can guide them in assessing vessel stability in any condition they face out at sea. Chapter 4 covers machinery. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented upon entry into force. All machinery, electrical installations, fish handling and processing equipment must be protected to minimize danger to people on board and prevent electric shock, flooding and fire risks. Effective alarms and communication systems must be in place for those on board. Chapter 5 covers fire safety. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented upon entry into force. Chapter 5 outlines all necessary provisions for fire safety and prevention. Specific items on board need to be constructed in a way that prevents fires and smoke from spreading. Alarms, sprinklers, ventilation and firefighting systems must be in place so that fires can be detected and extinguished wherever they may occur. Chapter 6 covers crew protection. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented upon entry into force. To keep the crew safe, various protection measures like guards and non-slip treads need to be in place. Hatch combings and rails need to meet a minimum height for crew safety as well. Chapter 7 covers life-saving appliances. It applies only to new vessels and must be implemented up to five years after entry into force. All life-saving appliances such as life jackets, life buoys and survival craft must be accessible to crew and regularly inspected and approved for use. Everything in this chapter applies to new vessels with the exception of handheld radio communications which are required on all vessels to communicate distress. Chapter 8 covers emergency procedures. It applies to new and existing vessels and must be implemented up to five years after entry into force. Vessel safety is not achieved merely with the design, construction or equipment on board. It also relies on the crew's ability to deal with emergencies. Crews must be trained in emergency procedures regularly practice drills and have proper instructions on how to use alarm systems required on board every vessel. 
Chapter 9 covers radio communications. It applies to new and existing vessels and must be implemented up to 10 years after entry into force. Every vessel must be provided with a global maritime distress and safety system compliant radio capable of transmitting distress signals anywhere it travels. Chapter 10 covers navigational equipment. It applies to new and existing vessels and must be implemented up to five years after entry into force. All fishing vessels must be fitted with some basic shipborne navigational equipment, such as a standard magnetic compass, suitable nautical instruments, and up-to-date charts for intended voyage. Vessels must be able to signal in the event of a power failure. To ensure that these vessels are safe, their design, construction and equipment must be inspected and surveyed at regular intervals. Evidence of such surveys for foreign flagged vessels can be requested by any party to the agreement. In practice, this means port and coastal states can ensure the safety of the fishers and fishing vessels entering their ports and waters, even where the foreign flag is not a party themselves. It will take the cooperation of all states to raise the global safety standards in one of the world's most dangerous professions. The Cape Town Agreement's entry into force would complement the FAO Port State Measures Agreement, which works to prevent illegal catch from being landed in ports, and the ILO Work in Fishing Convention, which sets decent working and living conditions for fishers. Together, we can make fishing safer. It's time to prioritize fisher safety. It's time to implement the Cape Town Agreement.